Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan and and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So we went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. May God bless these readings of his word to us. When we are young, most of us have heroes. Growing up, it's normal to have those we look up to. For many boys and girls, they want to emulate top sports stars, movie stars, or pop stars. During the past week, there has been enormous excitement in the Paris Olympics for Northern Ireland sports fans. On Tuesday, two top swimmers from Northern Ireland won gold medals. Daniel Whiffen from uh, Marilyn near Lurgan secured his gold winning the 800 metre freestyle final and Jack McMillan from Belfast gained his gold as part of the, the victorious 4x200 metre freestyle relay squad. This dynamic duo have etched their names into history and on a legendary list, along with Hannah Scott from Coleraine, who won gold in the Women's Quadruple Skulls event on Wednesday. What a memorable rowing final it was, with its dramatic photo finish. And so too has Rhys McLenaghan from Newton Ards, who won gold last night in the men's pommel horse. These names of Daniel Whiffen, Jack McMillan, Hannah Scott, Rhys McLenaghan will now be mentioned alongside the likes of Lady Mary Peters, Stephen Martin and Jimmy Kirkwood as Olympic podium toppers. There's been much talk this week of how Daniel and Jack and Helen and now Rhys, I'm sure, will be role models to young aspiring athletes in Northern Ireland. I'm sure that will be the case. The influence of role models is really powerful. And so the importance of having good role models cannot be stressed enough. Young folk here today, who are your role models? Who are the people you look up to the most? Whose steps do you want to follow in? Are they those who've made a name for themselves in one way or another? Are they celebrities or stars of stage or screen or sports? Or are your role models those, not from the world so much, but those who are within the church? Are your heroes those who are heroes of the faith, those who serve King Jesus and who spread his gospel? In 2 Kings chapter 6, we read about a group of guys at Bible college around 2,800 years ago. And it's obvious who their role model was. It's clear whom they look up to. Their mentor was Elisha, the Lord's chief prophet in that era. Back in chapter 4, we we read back then of the time when these guys, do you remember, they got into a stew because one of them tried to be like a Jimmy Oliver and to spice up the dinner. But the wild gourd they chopped up and chucked into the pot was actually poisonous. And they all nearly ended up in the A&E to have their stomachs pumped. Who was it that they immediately turned to for help at that time of calamity? It was Elisha, of course, they cried out to. O man of God, there's death in the pot. The guys were in no doubt. Elisha was a true man of God. And in their crisis, they threw themselves upon him and he came to the rescue. He performed a wonderful miracle by God's power and he purified the poisonous stew. Well, obviously these guys thought that this was wonderful. They would have been so thankful. 
and their respect for Elisha would have risen even more. He was clearly the one they looked up to, and this comes out again in our episode today. These trainee prophets were going to the River Jordan in chapter 6 here to build new premises for themselves. And one of them said to Elisha, please come with us. These lads plainly didn't want to go without their master because he wasn't just their master, he was their mentor. And this was so evident too as they were building their new premises because one of these students got himself into trouble. He, he lost his axe head in the Jordan and it was Elisha once more to whom he turned to for help. Elisha was their role model. Young people, what about you? Who are you looking up to most today? Whose example are you seeking to follow? It's a really important question for you to ask yourself. Of course, every Christian is to look up first and foremost to Christ our King, our magnificent Master in all of his mercy. But God also gives us other believers to encourage us and to be examples for us. And in the Bible and in church history and in today's church, there are many such believers who are great examples because of their devotion, service, wisdom and boldness in Christ's work. The Apostle Paul was one such example. And Paul actually said to the Christians at Corinth, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Young folk, do you look to such believers as your role models? Or are, you, are you seeking to follow their lead? Be like these guys at Bible College here. Look to men and women of God to be your role models. Now for those of us who are older in the faith here today, let us also take the challenge of all of this. Because this is our calling in today's generation. We are to be Christ-like role models for those younger in the faith. We're to be godly examples to those growing up under our care, within our families, within our church family, and in the wider church. Younger Christians should be able to look at our lives and be encouraged and spurred on in their service for our Saviour. May our God help us in our struggles to be such examples. Well, let's turn to the miracle at the start of chapter 6 here. The miracle of the aquatic axe, as one writer puts it. In this episode, we see what's evident in so many places of the Bible. Friends, we see here a combination in the Lord's work. On the one hand, we see God's servants taking steps forward in their mission work for the Lord. But on the other hand, we see God's servants facing setbacks in their mission work for the Lord. Isn't that exactly how it is for us in this generation as we serve our Saviour today? In the Christian life, there are numerous blessings. But in the Christian life, there are also numerous battles. In the Christian life, there are encouragements which cause our hearts to rejoice but in the Christian life there are also discouragements which can bring much sadness and hurt and steps forward and setbacks often arise at much the same time. Well that's what we see here in this short episode. Let's think first of all about an encouraging step forward in the opening four verses. Friends in the land of Israel at this time Idolatry was rife. Many professing to worship the Almighty had actually turned their back upon him and they were worshipping Baal. And there was widespread apostasy throughout the nation. And yet our Lord was still at work and our God was still strengthening and sanctifying his true servants. And our King was adding to their number. And that's why the sons of the prophets come up with their suggestion in verses 1 and 2. And they said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell, Elisha, under your charge. It's too small for us now. Let's go to the Jordan and each of us there get a log and let's make a place for us to dwell there. 
They were really saying, in effect, Elisha, our accommodation is not adequate enough for us all now. There's so many of us. That was their message to their master. Well, of course, this was a healthy problem to have. This was a really good problem for the Bible college to have. Such an increase in numbers training for the ministry that there wasn't adequate room for them all. Now, as I said, the good news story here came at a time of apostasy in the nation. And note what this good news story is sandwiched between. This story comes just after the very sad account of Gehazi's fall into sin that we were reflecting upon last week. Gehazi had been greatly honoured by God. He was Elisha's right-hand man, Elisha's personal servant, and therefore Gehazi had heard God's word and had witnessed God's works time and again, firsthand, through Elisha. So Gehazi was a, a greatly favoured man a highly privileged human being. But tragically, sin had taken hold of Gehazi's heart. Indeed, Gehazi was consumed by greed. And he ended up with a terrible punishment from God. Naaman's leprosy as a fearful punishment from heaven. What a devastating turn of events for all who were involved in God's work at that time just before this encouraging episode. And then note, immediately after this encouraging episode, we read of tension in international relations between Israel and Syria. We're told of Elisha being pursued by the king of Syria. And so this encouraging development in God's work at the start of chapter 6 came in the midst of setbacks. Yes, these signs of spiritual life and growth came between Gehazi's spiritual decline and Syria's evil plots. Well, what brought about this encouraging step forward? What was behind it all? Why was there an increase in men for the ministry? Well, of course, it was all God's doing. It's the Lord alone who calls and convicts men to go into the ministry of the word. But God undoubtedly used a human instrument in this. The Lord undoubtedly used Elisha's spirit-led ministry to inspire men to dedicate themselves to full-time service. Friends, healthy, humble, biblical leadership in the Church of Christ reproduces itself in the lives of others. Therefore, healthy, God-honouring leadership not only equips God's people to serve him in difficult days, healthy, Christ-glorifying leadership also brings to birth similar ministries. And in this way, other servant-hearted leaders are raised up by the Almighty. And so the Lord used Elisha's spirit-led ministry to influence and to inspire many others in their service for God. And when these new leaders were raised up, their training was obviously top priority for Elisha. And that's why the prophet invested so much time here in training these men. Obviously, Elisha realized that God was using his ministry to call other men into full-time Christian service. And so he knew that he was responsible for equipping and preparing them for ministry. Friends, during times of spiritual decline, there are normally few men who aspire to enter into full-time service for the Lord. And so this multiplication of leadership here in Elisha's day was a sure sign of spiritual recovery and growth, beginning at least. And as more and more entered the ministry back then, their new building project became inevitable because their existing facilities and premises hadn't, hadn't just become stretched, they'd become totally inadequate and new premises needed to be developed. My friends, it is unrighteousness and heresy and unbelief that shut down Bible colleges and churches and gospel ministries. On the reverse, it is righteousness, truth and living faith in Christ 
that maintain and open Bible colleges and churches and expand their ministry. Well, that is precisely what was happening in Elisha's day. And is this not what we long to see in our own day and in our own gospel denomination? We long for our king to strengthen and sanctify his church and to bring about growth by raising up servant-hearted students for the ministry who will walk humbly with God, acting justly and loving mercy. We thank God for the men, I think it's four men, who will start at our college this September. But there is a pressing need for so many more. May our college be marked by righteousness, truth and living faith in Christ, that the Lord may prosper his work amongst us. In our day of such need for a revival in righteousness in the church, may the Lord of heaven have mercy upon all of us. And may our God bring growth and strengthening and encouraging steps forward in the building of Christ's church. Now note how the actual building project in Elisha's day started. The vision of bigger premises came from the students themselves. It wasn't Elisha who was given the plan. It was his trainees. Of course, Elisha was humble and teachable. And Elisha could see that the idea was from God. And Elisha gave it the go-ahead. Friends, as Christ's kingdom advances today, leaders in his church are not the only ones who have God-given ideas and vision. Our king can speak to his church through any of his people. And those of us who are elders must listen respectfully to members and prayerfully and carefully consider suggestions they make. This actually reminds me of one of our midweek meetings in my former congregation, Clock Mills in County Antrim. The midweek home group took place about 23 years ago. I was in my very first year of ministry in Clock Mills. We were having a Bible study in a member's home. And it was there that I first heard one of our members in Clock Mills speak of our need to develop our premises. Well, I was quite taken aback. I'd only arrived. And I hadn't given any consideration to extending our premises. But that comment by that member at that midweek group led to our elders and deacons considering what needed to be done to our buildings. And over the following five years, things developed amazingly. And by God's grace and provision, the new building in Clock Mills was opened in May 2006. Elders must listen respectfully to members and carefully consider suggestions they make. Now, of course, building projects involve personal sacrifice. And they call for much commitment and involvement from both elders and members. Well, this project in Elisha's day was owned by each of his trainees. There was a sense of ownership here. They were all in it together. Note how all the students resolved to gather materials together. Verse 2, let's go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let's make a place for us to dwell there. So Elisha's students weren't afraid of hard manual labour. They all mucked in together and everyone gave of their time, effort and resources. And so there was this very encouraging step forward at this point in Elisha's faithful, fruitful ministry. In a time of tremendous spiritual darkness and need in Israel, the light of the Lord was increasingly seen through those who knew the Lord, who walked with him and who loved him. Spiritual growth was very evident. Christian friends, spiritual development must be top priority in our lives and in this gospel congregation. Our relationships with King Jesus are to be deepening. Our likeness to King Jesus is to be developing. Pray for such growth earnestly. Pursue such growth energetically. We'll not grow as we ought by sitting back spiritually. There are two key factors in growing spiritually. First, you must centre your life each day on God's word. Pray for the Spirit to grant you wisdom, to renew your mind, and to enable you to obey 
as you meditate on God's life-giving truth. And second, you must commit yourself to serve King Jesus wholeheartedly in every aspect of your life, whatever the cost. Not simply by yourself, not going solo, but with your fellow believers within the church, in the church family that God's brought you to. In God's kingdom, there are no gains without pains. Christian friend, is such growth your goal? Are you setting your sights on spiritual development? Are you centering your life in God's word? Are you hungry for God's truth each day? Are you humble in applying God's truth to your life? And are you committing yourself to sacrificial service for King Jesus within your own life and family, within his church and in the wider community? Are you wholeheartedly living for the Lord, seeking his glory and the building up of his people? and the advance of his kingdom. Such spiritual growth was so evident at this time of Elisha. Is it evident at this time in your own life? Is it evident in our own church family and fellowship as your pastor? I believe it is. I see positive developments and changes in our church family. And I rejoice in every sign of spiritual life and growth in our lives. But together, my fellow believers, let's pursue such holiness, prayerfulness, faithful witness and worship increasingly. Let's spur each other on in our spiritual lives and service. Let's edify and encourage each other in Christ all the more. So firstly, here we see an encouraging step forward at this stage of Elisha's ministry. But secondly, we also see a discouraging setback on the heels of the encouraging development. Sometimes Christians are naive. Sometimes as Christians we can expect Christ's kingdom to advance and his church to be built without discouragements or setbacks or difficulties. But this is a harmful view to have because if Christians hold this view and then hardships really hit them, they become disheartened, disillusioned and deflated. Fellow believers, as we serve our King in his church today by his grace, we will witness encouraging developments, but at times we will also be hit by setbacks. And these setbacks could sap our energy and dampen our enthusiasm and make us feel like giving up, saying, what's the point of all of our demanding service? But if we keep trusting our King and doing what's right in the midst of setbacks, he'll minister to us in his grace. Indeed, we'll experience even more spiritual blessing than in good times, because our God delights to see us exercise our faith in him, especially in the face of fiery trials that we're enduring. And our God will make everything work out for our spiritual good and growth and his glory in such times, even though they can be so painful. Well, this is what happened back in Elisha's day. Look again at what took place here in this episode. Things were going really well for the Bible college students. These guys went all out to the Jordan together, united in purpose and vision. Their master and mentor was with them. They began to cut down trees with great enthusiasm. And so progress was being made. Things were developing well. Everybody was excited. But then suddenly, out of the blue, there was a setback. One of the students was hacking away at a tree on the banks of the river. This guy must have been unaware that the head of his axe was working loose. And he set to chopping away with such gusto that the iron blade slipped from its shaft on an upward stroke. Well, the axe head arched through the air and landed with a bloop midstream in the Jordan. And it sunk out of reach and out of sight in the midst of the muddy water. What a blow in more ways than one. And what made it even worse was that the axe head had been borrowed. And so the sorry student cried out to Elisha, Oh my Lord, it was borrowed. Now the fact that the axe head was borrowed shows that the lack of resources were real for this trainee. This young student didn't have an axe of his own. He didn't have the finances to buy an axe, so he had to borrow one. And so that's why he was in despair when it sank. It was a disaster because it wasn't his. 
and he'd no grant to go and buy another axe. He'd no savings to dip into. One writer points out that in the ninth century Israel, iron tools would have been tremendously expensive. It would have taken hours of labor to gather wood for the fires to refine the ore to make such an axe. And then the craftsman making the tool had to shape and to sharpen the axe. And so such implements were pricey. One commentator says that with there being little money around, losing a borrowed axe head would be like wrecking a borrowed car today. And so this was a catastrophe for this young college student. It wasn't just a matter of him popping down to the local hardware store to buy a new axe head. There was no way he could have done that. Such a thing was way beyond his means. So this panic-stricken student was in dire straits. This was a severe setback for him. Yet in his helplessness, he did the right thing. He cried out to the man of God, looking to Elisha for aid. He did, in doing so, he brought the crisis to God himself. And so this sorry student looked to the Lord in faith, in the face of a disaster. And he believed that God would supply his pressing need. And that's precisely what the Lord did for him. God's prophet performed another astonishing miracle. And he did it by performing another symbolic action. This time Elisha didn't throw in salt or flour, as he had before in performing miracles. No, Elisha threw a stick into the very place where the axe head had disappeared. And at once the iron head rose to the surface, and it floated there for everybody to see. Elisha said to his amazed apprentice, lift it out. And his very grateful student reached out his hand and took it. Christian friends, the message of this miracle for you and me is simple. And yet it's vitally important for you and me to remember. Our individual personal needs matter to the Almighty. Your individual personal needs as a follower of the Lord Jesus matter to the God of heaven. After this axe head story, we're told about Israel's foreign affairs with Syria. As I mentioned, the Syrian king was threatening Israel. His army would advance on Elisha. Yet friends, even with all of that about to happen on the international front, our God cared about a little axe head borrowed and lost by one of his dear servants. My Christian friends, this is our God. This is what our God is like. Today we still witness the most terrible unrest and suffering in the Middle East. And the war in Ukraine is wrecking countless lives. And appalling atrocities continue to be carried out in Ethiopia and Afghanistan. And in many parts of the world, natural disasters are causing untold grief. Yet with all of these worldwide catastrophes, our God still has a deep concern for the little details of our lives which perplex us as we trust in him and serve him. Our God's agenda isn't too full for your burdens and needs. Our God isn't so busy or distracted with international affairs and disasters and with vast needs of the nations that he's no time for his children's personal concerns and circumstances because he's our heavenly father and we are his precious sons and daughters in Christ. Part of our God's greatness is that he's always concerned for his children in Jesus and for our individual needs. My fellow believer, the ordinary everyday affairs of your life really, really matter to the God of heaven. The very hairs of your head are numbered by your heavenly Father. And so our God cares about your axe heads. Our heavenly Father constantly cares about your daily pressing needs. And as you keep leaning upon him, he will work in every discouraging setback in your life 
for your spiritual good and growth and for his greater glory. In his almighty power and amazing grace, our God can turn your setbacks into stepping stones. And our God can turn your heart-rending battles into heart-rejoicing blessings. So if you feel deflated today by disappointments or greatly saddened by setbacks in your family or in your relationships or in your workplace or even in your church, keep looking to our God. Keep trusting in his almighty power, amazing grace, infinite wisdom and perfect righteousness. And you will witness our God at work in his wisdom, grace, power and righteousness, ministering to you even in the most perplexing, painful times of your life. My friend, King Jesus is totally worthy of all your trust and your worship. Rely upon Christ the King alone for salvation and for all of your daily needs. Our gracious Saviour and Good Shepherd never ever fails his people, his little sheep. May the Lord so help us all. Let us join in prayer.